Night Falls in Chicagoland as we open up the final series of the 2016 season as the Sox tangle with the visiting Minnesota Twins at U.S. Cellular Field. Good evening, everybody. Jason Benetti, Steve Stone along with you. Carlos Rodon gets his final start of the year, and last time he was marvelous. He threw against the Cleveland Indians, and he was absolutely unhittable, striking out 11 of those Indians, and you know they got a pretty good team. Lifetime 2-2 two and two against this Minnesota team. Last time, the fastball was right where he wanted it. The wipeout slider was absolutely perfect, and everything went very well for him. Hopefully tonight more of the same as he looks to win his ninth game of the year. And you'd have to say that this is a good year for Carlos Rodon. His last 10 starts, he's closing with a rush. Six and two with an ERA of 312, opponents hitting 242, and eight of them quality starts. So if he keeps that ratio over the course of his career, he's going to be a top of the rotation starter, and we would expect him to do just that. Well, we know about the Sox third baseman and his power ability, but the slugging may come in this game from second base. Brian Dozier is having just a wonderful year. He's hit 42 home runs, 40 as a second baseman. That's an all time major league record. 40 home runs as a second baseman and Dozier has hit eight against our Sox. Against the Sox this year hitting 404. And as you can see he keeps seeing high fastballs keeps hitting them out of the park. But we have an answer to that. Boom boom Sanchez. Carlos Sanchez in the month of September he's hit 313. All four of his home runs and 17 of his runs batted in in the 18 games in September. So he had a home run last night. We're looking for more of the same from him. He's gotten an opportunity to play and he's made the most of it. He was a large part of that series win against Tampa Bay. Sox took three of four. Minnesota's in and Jose Abreu ready to shake it out. Strong end of the season for Jose. He's in the lineup tonight. Sox and Twins coming up.
Sox Baseball on CSN Chicago is brought to you in part by Toyota. Discover more in a Toyota. Visit buyatoyota.com or your local Toyota dealer today. Let's go places. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois. Through it all. Audi. Truth in engineering. And by Xfinity. Xfinity X1 will change the way you experience TV. Boy, it's a chilly night here at U.S. Cellular Field. Chilly and kind of damp. The rain came through early, and we are ready for action here in Chicago with the White Sox and Twins starting the final series of the year. It's a three-game set as Carlos Rodon will take the hill for the Sox, and we say rain, rain, go away. After a 35-minute delay last night, an hour 37 in game two nights ago after a delay to start the game of about 20 minutes. So... The skies are clear so far. Carlos Rodon in search of win number nine and start number 28 of his sophomore season as a Major League Baseball player. Here's the starting lineup he'll face for the Twins presented by Kia. Brian Dozier, Steve told you about in the open. He's had a marvelous second half. Robbie Grossman last 16 games. He's been quite good. All the way down to Buxton, a very talented center fielder batting ninth for Paul Molitor. Let's take a look at the Honda City defense, and now Robin is going to line him up behind Carlos Rodon. Left to right in the outfield, Melky Cabrera, Leury Garcia, and Adam Eaton. In the infield, Todd Frazier, Tim Anderson, Carlos Sanchez, and Jose Abreu, with Omar Nervaez getting the nod behind the plate. And our Lexus pursuing perfection starting pitcher is Carlos Rodon. Looking for his ninth win. Looking to get that earned run average down below four. Everybody loves to end the season with a three. As a first number there, ERA. The umpires for the game tonight. Trip Gibson behind the plate. Last time we saw him behind the plate, he had a good game with Pat Holberg, Nick Lentz, and Hunter Wendelstead, the crew chief, is at third. So Carlos, who last time out, threw everything in the zone. He walked three, he fanned 11. The Indians could do absolutely nothing with him. His wipeout slider was outstanding. He was able to get ahead and stayed ahead of most of the hitters. And he's going to throw against a ball club that's managed by a Hall of Famer, Paul Molitor. And you would think that he would be back regardless of who the new president and general manager is as the Twins are looking. So we're ready to play baseball. They've thrown the ball around the infield means baseball on the way and so is Jason Bonetti. I'm actually here. Thank you. I just made it for game time. Way to go. Carlos Rodon's first pitch is in there for a strike. It's 7 10. Did I hear Bob Rosenberg say 63 degrees 53. Oh 53. Yeah boy oh boy. 63. 73 maybe. It's a beautiful night. 63 is what he said but the wind is barreling through this ballpark and creating the need for long sleeves on some. You don't buy 63 at game time today do you. Not with the wind chill factor because the wind is gusting upwards of 30 miles an hour you look at the flags to the left of the scoreboard and they're starched to top the poles. Three balls at a strike on Brian Dozier. And there you see the gale force winds at points. Now Dozier is squeezing the sawdust out of the bat as he figures to get a fastball on three and one. 28 home runs after the All Star break for Dozier. Three career against Carlos Rodon. Last 12, however, he's hitting 137. So as hot as he was the last time we saw him, that's how cool he's been over the last couple of weeks. He tags it foul left side three and two on Dozier it's a twins team. It's hitting 252 as a group of the strikeout has been a major issue third most in the American League at thirteen hundred and ninety three strikeouts. They can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Payoff pitch from Carlos and he got him with a slider down and in one out. This Minnesota team has hit 196 strikeouts. That's among baseball's best. And there you look at the 3 2 slider. And Dozier has no chance. That's why it's so important for Carlos to get ahead. That slider, which is anywhere from 88 to 90 miles an hour when he throws the wipeout variety into the right hand hitters, 
They just can't touch it. Jorge Polanco takes a ball. When you look at the average velocity for Carlos Rodon on that slider, it is worth mentioning it just, just did the, the two different variations of it that he throws because the average number is about 87 miles an hour. But that's taking into account all of the sliders he throws. Yeah, he's got to get me over, which he throws 80, 45 miles an hour. That's what he's looking for, strike one. And he's got the put away, which is his strikeout pitch, and that's higher 80s. Ball and two strikes on Polanco. Polanco, a switch hitter. Been a better hitter from the right side, although it's been just a small sample size. 63 at bats as a right hand hitter, hitting 317, 265. As a left hand hitter, not a whole lot of power from either side, but they're giving him an opportunity to win the job at shortstop, even though they played him at second in the minor leagues. Just a 23 year old shortstop, Polanco. Two and two. And he got him swinging, strike three, low and in. Second strikeout for Carlos Rodon, who punched down a career high tying 11 last time. Here it is again. And there he goes. It's going to be a difficult night for Omar Narvaez in that Carlos is going to throw a lot of those sliders in the dirt. With nobody on, not a big deal, but he's going to be blocking a few and trying to save 90 feet on many occasions tonight. Two down for Grossman. And there is strike one. Told you about the velocity on Carlos Rodon's slider. It's one of the fastest, even with that get me over taken into account. It's one of the fastest left handed sliders in the game of baseball today. At 87 plus miles an hour, he is fourth in Major League Baseball of left handers in terms of slider velocity. Here we see Cody Reed, Clayton Kershaw, Stephen Matz, who was lost as they clean out his elbow with bone chips. Another one of the bad breaks the Mets have caught and the Mets leading Philadelphia two to one. What great races the wild card race coming down to the last weekend of the season. We'll keep you posted on that wild card race in both leagues Detroit having to beat Atlanta probably try to sweep them in Atlanta they're leading three to nothing bottom of the second. We have team coverage tonight on the wild card races Steve and I will both be watching the scoreboard. Pretty interesting. I mean, you love to see any race come down to the last weekend, and the divisions all decided. A little bit high, three and two on Grossman after two strikeouts to start the inning. The Orioles and Blue Jays are tied at the top of the American League Wild Card, a game and a half up on Detroit, which is already leading Atlanta tonight. There's strike three. He drops it in, and Grossman can only get rid of all of his equipment. Rodon strikes out the side in the first.
media, kicking up some dust. Adam Eaton, Tim Anderson, Melky Cabrera, the top three. Tim has had a nice season against the Twins. And Abreu Morneau, the former twin, and Frazier. Carlos Sanchez, Narvaez gets it started. Catcher and Leori Garcia batting up. On the city defense, and now Paul Molitor is going to line him up behind Tyler Duffy. Grossman, Buxton, and Schaefer in the outfield with Escobar, Polanco, Dozier, and Kenneth Vargas playing first base. Then John Ryan Murphy behind the plate. Our Lexus pursuing perfection starting pitcher is Tyler Duffy, who's 9 and 11. ERA way up there. And with 161 hits and 131 innings, you best not walk anybody. He's got good control. Trying to depend on a curveball to get people out. Out of baseball powerhouse Rice University, Duffy with a foul ball for strike one from Adam Eaton, who was at the top of the card after missing a bit of this homestand after colliding with the wall in Cleveland. Another solid season at the plate for Adam Eaton. Slugging 432, batting first. What are we going to see from Duffy tonight? You're going to see that curveball, and he throws the occasional straight change. His fastball is a good, but not a great fastball. You can see the movement on it, and he's not going to—he's not going to knock your eyes out with velocity. So he's got to depend on control. You see the fastball, 54 percent. His curveball, close to 40 percent, with a changeup infrequently. It's the breaking ball, and Eaton gets a piece of it. Like more of a slider there. That's apparently what it was. I mean, it didn't have the curveball spin, so I think he was trying to shorten up the break on it. That was a that was an emergency hack. As Duffy, at 25 years old, a fifth round draft pick, drafted back in 2012, and. He followed through with the swing after the ball was fouled off. Well, that fastball had so much run the first time Adams saw it. Pitch number three, as you saw on pitch tracks. I think he thought it was going to have the same kind of result and clip the corner. So he decided, well, better get rid of it. There you can see most of the pitches inside this at bat. Another breaking ball in the dirt, and this time he gets rid of Eaton. So Duffy with a strikeout, and we've had only strikeouts tonight. Not good for our picks to click. Somebody's going to have some offense tonight. You can vote online at whitesockscom pick to click And thank you to the fans for voting Melky to take him away from Steve for the first time in a long time. Thank you, fans. We love you very much, and especially tonight. Crew with the lead: Tim Anderson, Garcia, and Eaton in the booth. My guy is struck out already. You sound despairing. Well, it's tough. That's a very tough way to start. It's an uphill climb from here on out. Oh, but it's a long game, this national pastime of ours. Look at the run on that fastball from Duffy. Got good movement, and we have lots of wind. That one probably moves a good three or four inches. If you don't have an overwhelming fastball and he doesn't, you better have good late movement, and he seems to have that. In a brief stint last year, five and one in ten starts. So he got called up. Ball again. He got called up after making a couple of stops at Chattanooga and Rochester. That made the most of his 10 starts, an ERA of 310. There you look at the career numbers, and he's over 500 from a team that has a tough year this year. That ball stayed up, and Anderson blasts it to right center field, and it's off of Buxton. Anderson off to the races, around second, going for third, and Tim's there standing up. Wynn probably playing some tricks with it, but. Byron Buxton has to make that play. He usually does. He's exceptional in center field, and his speed got him there as a high fastball up and out of the zone, tattooed to right center field. 
as he lets them get there. And he just misses it. And I have to believe that the wind was a huge factor. He hardly gets a glove on it. That one hit off his chest. With that, runner at third, one out in the infield, back in the middle. Escobar playing in at third for Melky Cabrera, who got one of these RBIs last night with the infield back. Melky this year against the Twins, 452. 12 RBIs of his 83 for the year. It is officially a triple for Anderson. His sixth of his rookie season. He'll take it. Pretty good. He's got great speed. That was a bit of a gift. In that when an outfielder gets to the baseball and then misses it. I expect him to catch that one. Melking looking for run batted in number 84 and a ground ball will get it done. See the frustration on his face to go down one and two. I think he's a little unhappy with his choice on the last pitch because it was way out of the strike zone as you see with Toyota pitch tracks. Duffy will have a tendency to get under the baseball and that means he'll open up with his front side a little too quickly when a right hander does that to a left hand hitter everything will stay up in a way. 2 2. Breaking ball hung. He hammers it down the line. And Melky's got the first run for the Sox. It's yet another double for Melky Cabrera. It's 84 of them driven in. And without the burden of me selecting him for pick to click. He is free to double with reckless abandon. So Duffy's made a couple of mistakes, gotten a couple pitches up. And both Anderson and Cabrera have made the most of it. Melky now three off his career high of 44 doubles that he sent with Kansas City five years ago. Rayu takes a strike. Jose, that last series against the Twins was outstanding with three home runs. Really started his surge late this season. On the ground, Polanco. For round number two. We got two guys at 98. He runs batted in, looking for just two more in these three games. Cabrera one, not Frazier two. And they are batting on either side of Justin Morneau. He's had a nice season for the Sox, coming back after the All Star break. He takes a strike. Didn't know what to expect when he went back and faced the Twins in a White Sox uniform. First time he had played against them in an opposing uniform, and he got a standing ovation from the crowd. They really appreciate what he did all those many years he was there. You could see, well, he was on the pregame show during that series you could see on his face exactly how important it was to him yep. to come back and have his kids see the reception that dad got at Target Field. Down and in one and two on Morneau Cabrera at second two out first inning. And in those days it was a big threesome of Morneau Kadair and Maurer. And Joe Maurer's had some leg problems. That's why he's not in the lineup tonight. Morneau still makes his home in that area, so it was particularly gratifying for him and his family to get that kind of reception. Tags a 1-2 foul. Still a ball and two strikes on Morneau. Joe Maurer. There's the man that 
was a plus offensively when he was a catcher because of concussions and assorted injuries they moved him to first base they've got him for two more years at substantial money. On the ground Polanco plants and throws it wide. That ball could have gotten out of the infield twice once into foul ground on the first base side and once into left. Both of these last two teams employed something of a shift. This one not near as radical as the one that was employed in the last series. But his last three hits have come to the left side of the infield. So with Tampa an analytic strictly ball club they shifted early on him and then after he beat the shift the first time they went back to almost a straight up defense. Frazier wants those RBIs and he fouls the first pitch fastball away. Todd before the game there was, there was some question of whether or not this game was going to get in because of the rain he said we better play it I want yeah. I want 100. Ball and a strike on Frazier. He also has, I believe, some added responsibility being your partner in the bags tournament tomorrow. That is a heavy responsibility of carrying the team. On the ground and foul. Well, it's only because you said no. On the air. I felt it, it wouldn't be fair to have a former pitcher being able to do it with a cash prize on the line. So you went ahead and got a current player with much better reflexes. Who needs an X ringer when you can have when a you current have ringer? A regular ringer. One and two. Checked his swing, ball in the dirt. Frazier didn't go, says Pat Hoberg, the first base umpire. Two and two. And Duffy now wrapping on the door of 30 pitches in this first inning. They do employ the radical shift with Dozier on the third base side of second. He's playing pretty much up the middle. And nobody home on the right side. Up and in, and Frazier down to the deck. A run comes in. Melky scores. Morneau to second. Frazier will be petitioning the league office. He's just happy to be able to get out of the way of that one. There's a high tight fastball. And it gets by Murphy. So it goes as a wild pitch. Count now three and two on Frazier. Two nothing Sox already in the first inning. Sox 11 and 5 this year against the Twins. Trying to build on that. And Duffy has made 30 pitches this first inning. That is not conducive to a long outing. <laughs> Frazier's eyes lit up with that fastball up. Three and two from Duffy to Frazier. Morneau at second. Payoff. Been in another foul. A lot of fastballs late in the count for Frazier from Duffy. This curveball very much his best pitch. 80 of his 110 strikeouts, over 72% have come with the curveball. But yet right handers have just tattooed him somewhat surprising right handers have hit 332 against him which is most unusual for right hand pitcher. Hanging breaking ball popped up. 
And that is the end of the inning off the catch by Dozier. Sox get two. Melky drives one in. Wild pitch gets one home. And it's time now for our Lowe's home field advantage. White Sox starters the last 22 games here at U.S. Cellular Field have been 15 and 7. The ERA has been 277. Opponents batting average of 226. Quality starts somewhat amazing. 18 of the 22 home games and the rest of the numbers commensurate with what you would expect for almost a team that wins two of three of their last month of baseball here at home. And as Vin Scully said on here we are on National Hispanic Heritage Night on the Fernando Valenzuela no hitter if you have a sombrero throw it to the sky. Strike one to Sano after a strike out the side first for Carlos Rodon. Sano has amazing power. Big rip and a foul ball, one and two. He also has a very strong ability of striking out. His strikeout rate is seventh highest in Major League Baseball if you're looking at a minimum plate appearances of about 100. Checks his swing and he did go strike three four straight punch outs for Carlos Rodon. That is strikeout number 174 in 427 at bats. There's another one of those wipeout sliders. So no still a young hitter. And in the baseball parlance if you can't teach power he's got that already what he has to do is get a little more selectivity. One down for Vargas. Still no contact from the Twins so far tonight. Vargas and Sano hitting back to back. Probably the biggest fourth and fifth hitter in all of baseball. Hitters. They're both in excess of 260 pounds. Presence of David Ortiz in the batter's box. Big burly guy. Vargas? Yeah. He's big and very strong, as is Sano, and the difference is Vargas is a switch hitter. Down he goes. Five straight punch outs for Carlos. That's a straight change, and you love to see him with the confidence to use that. And you would think that Omar Narvaez was going to call a few of those. That's one thing that he's going to have to work on. And if he gets confidence, 
where he can throw it in any count. He's going to win consistently 15 games and up. Foul ball. So Carlos Rodon, dating back to that start in Cleveland now, has struck out eight consecutive batters. He struck out the side in the eighth in Cleveland. He is getting it and throwing it. Two strikes. Rodon to Eduardo Escobar, who lays off. He's taking a page out of the book of Chris Sale, who, when he's feeling right, is going to work awfully quickly. That last fastball was 98 miles an hour, so Carlos has got it tonight. 98 again, two and two. Escobar switch hitter who's been a better hitter from the left side this year. Two two. Swing and a miss strike three. That's the inning and Carlos Rodon dating back to his last start has struck out nine in a row including Escobar who's addled by the Rodon slider. The U.S. Cellular Field where the White Sox are on top of the Twins 2-0 in the bottom of the second. Carlos Sanchez walking to the plate right now and before we get to his six game hit streak one of his walk up songs is the Macarena. I asked him did you lose a bet or something. He said no it's actually the new version. It's by Gente de Zona. It's one of a really popular groups out of Cuba right now and he said it just makes me want to move. Well it must be working because in his last six games he's hitting 409. He said he's feeling like an everyday player. He says this is one of the strongest finishes he's ever had for a season. And he said he's just trying to get up there, make the most out of every game, out of every at bat. And he hasn't been able to thank the fans enough for all the support they've given him in this last month of September. So maybe the Macarena is what's working for him, Jason and Steve. Well, Sierra, thank you. I, I mean, what other thanks can you give the crowd more than the Macarena? <laughs> I, a couple times a night, right? That's the thank you. And, uh, you know, it can be the new version, but Los Del Rio were the ones who planted that into our souls back in the 90s. So we thank them for that. Pretty much whatever works you go with and. It's working. He's staying with it. One two. Breaking ball chopped foul. If you had a walk up song right now. Say you're a hitter. You just have one at bat. What's your walk up song Steve Stone. My papa was a rolling stone. <laughs> He was a gymnast. 
Mm -hmm. So we qualify. Okay. Chipped foul. You know, if somebody said to you, Steve, I will give you a million dollars if you lay off this punt, I think you'd take the punt. I would. Yeah. It's not worth it. No, are you kidding? I mean, you know, as we know, the tax consequences are enormous. One and two swings back over. Strike three called. A little bit high. Sanchez rung up. There you see some good late movement, and although it came over the plate, the question is, was it a little too high? Well, in the interpretation of Trip Gibson, it wasn't. So Sanchez goes down. That is the second strikeout for Duffy. One down for Narvaez. How, how do certain pitchers create that very late movement like we saw there? It's usually the wrist. And it's usually what they do with the wrist as far as snapping it with the pitch, depending on how you're holding the baseball. Left handers just naturally seem to have a little more movement than right handers. Right handers have to create that movement. And in the case of Duffy, Looks like many times he'll kind of get under the ball a bit and then you'll see even more movement but he's not going to be able to be able to stay high and away to left handers consistently he's got to stay on top of the baseball upper reaches of the zone again one and two on Narvaez who doesn't like the call from Trip Gibson. And now with a two strike situation they go back out of the severe shift and playing almost straight up on the left side. No need strike three Duffy's punched out two here in the second inning. Live out your dream of becoming a professional baseball player by attending the White Sox Dodgers fantasy camp January 15th to the 21st at the spring training home of the White Sox and Dodgers at Camelback Ranch in Glendale, Arizona. For more info, call the fantasy camp hotline 623-302-5078. One thing we very likely can come close to promising you is warm weather. Nice weather and a beautiful facility, and you get a chance to see what Major League Spring Training is like. And it would be of you to go in shape, because if not, your chances of making it through the week aren't great. But I think everybody who has gone, I think they've had a wonderful time. And meeting the former players is just terrific. You hear lots of baseball stories you'd never hear anywhere else. I know the players that go there have a very good time. So give it a try. Registration open for this January. Oh, and two on Garcia. And he slashes it foul. There will be another one of those guys who's getting an opportunity to show a little bit of what he can do late in the season. He started out his career as a shortstop. He played just about any position in the infield, and with his speed. He's shown that he can play center field. He's run down a couple balls, even this homestand, yeah. that have carried out in center. And the outfield, last couple of nights, and certainly tonight, not an easy place to be because of the heavy winds. That's strike three. Duffy using the high fastball to his advantage. He strikes out the side. Hayes galore tonight.
ESPN Action Replay. And if you're just joining us, Carlos Rodon is on the cusp of history. He's fanned six in a row to start the ball game, and it's Dozier, Polanco, Grossman, Sano, Vargas, and Escobar as he goes down swinging on a low slider. Nice block by Narvaez. So all six outs recorded via the strikeout. Most consecutive strikeouts to begin a game in Major League history. Jacob DeGrom and Jim Deshays. The AL record is seven. And it's with the White Sox. Joe Cowley in 1986. Overall most consecutive strikeouts in a game not to start the game. As Rodon gets that one 0 and 2. That's Tom Seaver back in April of 1970. Ten consecutive strikeouts of San Diego. While with the Mets. O2. Strike three, seven in a row. Ten dating back to his last start. One of the things the hitters had best be aware of, and that is that Trip Gibson is going to call the high strike. And that one just barely caught a piece. You see where Narvaez wants it. That's exactly where Carlos threw it. Now it's lefty lefty as Logan Schaefer looking out at Rodon. Swing and a miss nothing in one he is untouchable literally so far tonight. Gets to face his first lefty. One ball one strike. It's 10 in a row dating back to that last start and 12 out of 13. He struck out five of the last six in Cleveland last time out. That ball is ripped to right to break the string. Logan Schaefer does it. And Carlos Rodon will have to settle for an American League record tying seven straight strikeouts to open the game. Schaefer got a fastball, drilled it into right field. So now, and I like the fact that Nervaez went out there to have a talk with him. Sanchez coming out to have a talk. So some of the air has gone out of the balloon. You lose the perfect game, the no hitter. You lose the strikeout record. You lose it all with one swing of the bat by Logan Schaefer. Now you got to get back to the fact that you only have a two run lead and deal with Buxton, who last time we saw him in Minnesota. Was thrown it very well and hitting it exceptionally well. Buxton three for eight against Rodon career. And fouled away. One ball, one strike. Went down to the minor leagues and he experimented somewhat and he's come back using a little bit more of a leg kick than he ever had before and it's worked out very well for him. He has all kinds of skills. He was the number one prospect in the minor leagues for a couple of years and never has really realized his potential here in the major leagues. He's been banged up a few times. Injuries have been very much of a factor for him but there's nothing that he can't do. Ball in the dirt, two and one on Buxton. That's seven straight strikeouts as well for Carlos Rodon. Ties a franchise record for any point in a game. Tied with Joe Cowley as well back in 86. With seven straight strikeouts at any juncture in a Sox game. Two and one to Buxton. He's up and out. I have to settle back in after that tremendous run. The Twins try to build a rally. 3 1. That's a strike call on the inside corner, 3 and 2.
Bucks in the second overall pick in the first round in 2012. His last few weeks, he's starting to live up to all of that potential. He lays off ball four, two on, one out. So if you're Carlos Rodon and you've got this seven in a row when you feel unbeatable, how do you put yourself back into that place or at least a place closer to that than having two straight runners on? Well, Narvaez went out to talk with him. Sanchez came in to talk with him, and they're both telling him the same thing. Only the third inning, you got a long way to go, and so you've got to pretend like nothing has happened because now the seven in a row doesn't mean anything after you gave up the double, and suddenly you find yourself with one of the league's most powerful hitters representing the go ahead run. 42 home runs of Brian Dozier with a massive swing, nothing in one. Took a little something off as Dozier looking first ball fastball and didn't get it. Tied for second in baseball with the 42 homers behind only Mark Trumbo. Dozier on the ground. Frazier at third. Sanchez at second. Gets cleaned out and turns two anyway. Five to four to three to rescue Rodon. Sox Insider all season long on CSNChicago.com presented by The Great Escape. Pools, patio furniture, hot tubs, and more. Escape your everyday shop, The Great Escape. Sox lead tonight. Two to nothing. RBI double, Melky Cabrera in the first inning. Then a wild pitch brought Melky home a little bit later. Tyler Duffy has got a strikeout string of his own. He struck out the side in the second as we swing back to the top. Yeah, the real headline tonight is Carlos Rodon seven straight strikeouts to open the game, tying an American League record. He was three off the all-time Major League record for strikeouts in a game from Tom Seaver. Carlos again dating back to his last start struck out 10 in a row. Two and oh from Duffy. Into the dugout and pinging into the crowd. That scattered a few in the dugout. Is Adam looking at his bat to see if it's still in one piece? Who was it last night? Corey Dickerson that was listening yeah. to his bat a couple times? Yeah. 
Trying to see if there was any vibration. Two and two. Another breaking ball for Eaton, swatted foul. Long at bat, first inning for Adam Eaton. He struck out finally after seven pitches. Windy, chilly night at the ballpark. Breaking ball off the plate, three and two. He tried to throw a back door curve ball, but it was wide. However, by that Toyota pitch track, so they had a piece of the plate. Come up here, looked like it went around it. Ball four high, lead off walk. Adam Eaton's on for the Sox in the third. So it'll be Tim Anderson who tripled and scored back in the first. Tim second and run scored in AL rookie rankings. He has 56 of them. 32 multi hit games tied for second among American League rookies as well. He takes ball one. I don't think a lot of folks would have thought that when Tim Anderson got his first shot at the major leagues, he'd wind up hitting in the neighborhood of 280, but that's the way it's been in this just an outstanding rookie season. It's one of those circumstances, too, if the Sox were heavily in the playoff race. Right now, Tim Anderson would be getting a lot of recognition around Major League Baseball for what he's done for this club since June. He's been very impressive and the greatest part of his development has been in the field since he came up. You don't see a lot of things that he did when he came up he smoothed it out. He's also shown if you make a mistake on him even in this young stage of his career he's going to make you pay he's very strong. Eaton at first and the one one tails away. Two balls and a strike. You know it's built as a curveball for Duffy but it really does have slider movement. I think that he can shorten it and I think that he can make it a little bit bigger. I think he throws it a couple different speeds. And whatever it is, it seems to work pretty well for him. However, like either curves or sliders when he gets it up, as he did a couple times in that first inning, he'll get hurt just because he gets under it. How do you avoid that? Usually you try to shorten your stride. If you're not getting the break on the curveball that you want, you try to shorten your stride. But one of the things that makes him unusual, we talked with the Hall of Famer, Burt Blylevin, before the game. He throws from the first base side of the mound. And most good curveballers, right handed, throw from the third base side so they can get a much better angle. And I know Burt said he threw from the extreme third base side. I threw from not quite as extreme as Burt did, but there you see it the first base side and for a curveballer that's somewhat surprising. Well you and Bird had an interesting conversation that I, I was literally sitting in between about where you both looked when you were throwing a curveball to yeah, the plate and Bird had one of the great curveballs around he threw 60 shutouts I mean a magnificent pitcher. That's a strike to Anderson three and two what he said was he threw at the glove. And I didn't because I felt I would throw at an area that I wanted the ball to go at because I knew it would break. So I would look at the outside of the left shoulder to right hand hitter where he threw where the catcher put the glove. Anderson drills this ball soaring foul to the upper deck. Give me an idea how strong he is. That one get out in front well foul. Eaton going on the pitch. But you take two pitchers who had great success and you both looked in totally different places yeah. when you're throwing a curveball. It just it's a feeling of comfort. Eaton at first three and two Adams off and it's a foul ball. So Duffy who struck out the side in the second inning finds himself 
in bubbling trouble in the third. Joe McEwing with some signs. Some saliva expulsion. Three and two for Anderson. Eaton runs again. Tim with a fly ball deep left field. Grossman has no play. It's gone. We'll tell you how strong he is. And after taking one very deep but foul. That time he waited a little longer and out in left center field in a heartbeat. The Ford home run replay as a fastball. Catching the inside part of the plate, but not inside quite enough. And Tim Anderson, 9 and 30 on the power numbers. He didn't like that Tim spectated a little bit. Tyler Duffy. Tell them to throw it in a different spot. Two in. Nobody out. And another generous donation from the Alex Nellius family in loving memory of Ursula. Maybe on tap again. Long fly ball from Melky to right center, and that gets down. Buxton visits the wall back first, and Melky has his second double. There was almost a nasty collision between Buxton and Schaefer. He gets a first ball fastball and perhaps Tyler Duffy should not worry about who's looking at what as opposed to who's throwing it where. And Melky with his second double. Having a conversation with Ryan Dozier 42 doubles for the milk man. I think Dozier is talking to Melky about Anderson. I think he just said he watched it. We'll see next time he comes up. There's an amazing preoccupation in baseball with celebration that doesn't exist, honestly, in other sports. That's true. Two strikes. On a Brayu, and that's it's nothing against the Twins alone here for for being frustrated with Tim Anderson on that. It's it's everywhere in the game. I mean, you you go overseas, you watch overseas, that is a part of the game. But we've seen a whole lot of a whole lot of guys unhappy with bad flips. Jose Bautista's black bat flip for the Toronto Blue Jays. We hear a whole lot about that. And apparently Tim hit it so hard he wanted to take a look at it. One and two on a Brayu. That's well struck but foul on the ground. I mean, where do you stand on that? You're a former pitcher. Yeah. Well, if I made a mistake and the guy hit it out, it didn't matter all that much to me. There's a school of thought saying you don't want to show up the opposition. That's one of the things. I guess one of the reasons why Jerry Rice in football got so much acclaim is that when he scored a touchdown, he just put the ball down, and sometimes he would just hand it to the referee or the official who happened to be closest to him. And did make a big deal about it because that's what he was paid to do. I think there are some people who think that when you do hit a home run, you just run around the bases and you call it a day. Smoked left field side. 
Melky scores. Abreu puts him there. It's 5 0. That's 99 for Jose Abreu. And apparently, that staring of the home run by Tim Anderson has taken a whole lot of the concentration out of the game for Tyler Duffy. Melky scores easily. That's going to be it for Tyler Duffy. Perhaps learned a bit of a lesson tonight, whether you think a guy showed you up or not. Use your concentration to get out of the inning. And so with Duffy walking out, we will also be back after these messages. White Sox host the Twins tomorrow at 6:10 p.m. First 5,000 fans to enter U.S. Cellular Field will receive a Rock and Roll Night cap compliments of guaranteed rates. Our Hyundai call to the pen is the left-hander Pat Dean on for the 19th time. One and six has not been a good year for him. 6:33 ERA. There you look at the numbers. Dean against Morneau who clubs this ball to center field. Buxton keeps his feet. Abreu on his way to third. Buxton slipped when he went after that but that one stayed up long enough for him to use his makeup speed to make the play. Remember we had a lot of rain. Yesterday last night. Some rain before the game today. So the outfield maybe a little slicker than normal. In the infield in at all four positions. Todd Frazier with a golden opportunity to pick up his 99. Infield in for the Twins in a 5 nothing game in the third. And Dozier is way in. He's on the grass at second. Polanco is much further back at shortstop. Dozier probably playing on the grass because he doesn't want a hop that goes from the grass to the dirt because he's worried about the spin. Also, the fact that Frazier very rarely hits the ball to the right side. Abreu at third after a double that scored Melky Cabrera. One and one from the left hander Dean. High in the air on the infield. Vargas. Well, it's up to Carlos Sanchez. As this game goes along, first of all, to see a 
how much we hear the Macarena. Second of all, <laughs> to see what happens next time Tim Anderson comes to the plate after that home run this inning that the Twins took exception to. Remember, earlier this year, there were some hot tempers in this ballpark between the Sox and Twins. Jose Abreu got hit with a pitch and stared off at the mound for a while. Into left field, Grossman. Four out number three. And that'll do it. But the Sox, behind the strength of young Tim Anderson, put up three runs, two on this swing. It's 5 nothing. Ready for the game against the Lions with Chris Bowden, Lance Briggs, Alex Brown, and Jim Miller on Bears pregame live. Then join the guys afterwards on CSN Plus for their thoughts. Plus, to hear your players and Coach Fox on the Bears postgame live, you can join Bears game day coverage. It begins on Sunday at 11 a.m. on CSN. Full day of football coming your way Sunday. We'll have the Sox finale as well. At 210 here at U.S. Cellular Field, Chris Sale gets the ball. He chose to make that start. A lot of people wonder why, for the first time this year, that Sunday game is going to start at 210. In the air, left side, Melky on the run. For round number one. And the reason why they started 210 is that they want all the games to start at the same time. So it's 310 in the east, obviously 210 here, 1210 out on the west coast. The reason is they don't want every, anybody in the wild card race or in the division race, if there was a division race, they don't want anybody to have an advantage. So if you're on the west coast and you see a team that is competing against you and they lose a ball game, you're not going to throw, let's say, your number one or two starter in that what will be then a meaningless game. That's why. All the games start at the same time. The pitcher who was supposed to pitch for you will pitch, and nobody has a big advantage. Center field, Garcia dancing with the wind for round number two. And speaking of that wild card race in the American League, the two teams in the lead right now have big advantages, at least compared to when we last checked. The Jays have scored three on the Red Sox to lead 3 1. The Orioles have Eight tonight. They lead the Yankees eight to one in the home sixth. So the Tigers, who are up five nothing in the top of the fifth, would need a loss somewhere from the Jays and Orioles. And the Mariners would, st would start in motion an unbelievable set of events that could possibly happen, or maybe none at all. Maybe the Tigers go home if the teams in front of them don't lose. 
And again, if you own the tiebreaker for the wild card and you end in a tie, the tiebreaker does not give you the wild card. It gives you the ability to host a game to decide who's going to go into the wild card game to face the other team on the next day. But the Tigers, part of their scenario is a game that they just lost due to weather on Thursday. If that game matters for either the Indians or the Tigers or both, that'll have to be played Monday before anything else gets decided. I think that one's going to matter for the Indians very much. Here's strike three. Sano has not had a nice night against Rodon. Carlos has shut out so far along with eight strikeouts. to Miller time later in the game brought to you by Miller Light and White Sox fans next time you want to grab White Sox seats get the StubHub app we take the price and location of seats and show you which tickets at StubHub give you the best deal so get the StubHub app today why don't you I told you about the American League wild card race in the National League tonight the Cardinals lead the Pirates one nothing in the fourth the Cardinals are in chase mode trying to catch either the Mets or the Giants Mets are leading 3 1 in the eighth in Philadelphia the Giants are home for the Dodgers at 9 15 Narvaez gives it a ride to right field and gone first major league home run by Omar Narvaez and it was the cheapy the fireworks going off and Nervaez, who's been very impressive in this his initial campaign, hits it a mile. Our fourth home run replay. Pat Dean leaves a fastball on the inner portion of the plate, and Omar takes it way back. A deposit into the Minnesota bullpen for the first home run for Omar Narvaez. Now Garcia takes ball one. That is a dugout having a great deal of fun with Omar. And hopefully they'll be able to get that baseball back. Very happy young man as you would expect. He's been pretty impressive. He's coming up and injuries got him the opportunity to get a look that he might not otherwise have gotten. Garcia to right field. And the Sox offense has been lethal so far tonight. Eight hits. Two home runs, three doubles, and a triple. Sox knocked out Duffy early. Two plus 
Five earned. Eaton. He's had a couple of those swings tonight. You could hide Leori Garcia behind Vargas at first. <laughs> Nobody know he'd be there. There's a really big man playing first base. You know how sometimes you play hide and seek and it's difficult to find a good hiding spot. Found it. Right behind Vargas. Oh and two. On the ground. Dozier the flip. Polanco the turn not in time. Twins only get one. Here's your Sox math question for tonight. Hashtag Sox math first correct answer with surprise. Number of home runs Carlos Sanchez has hit this month entering tonight. Add the number of seasons Carlton Fisk played with the White Sox. Divide the number of seasons Chris Sabo played with the White Sox. And multiply Ron Kittle's 1983 RBI total into the history books. You could win the sunglasses, the Gene Honda ball, that Paul Canerco thing. Uh, Paul Canerco Canerco glass. Thing, huh? Yeah, it's a Paul Canerco thing. What is it? I don't know, but Joe Groob was searching around in the archives and came up with it. So it looks like, well, it's a very small travel bag oh, it's for a bag. very short travels, yes. And it has in it a bobblehead. The Jermaine Dye bobblehead sold separately. Foul ball from Tim Anderson. See the Paul Canerco thing? It's a it's a bag. You can put your stuff in it. You put things in it. Things and stuff. And maybe there's a bobblehead for you. Well, maybe there is. We're a uh, new age Irwin Mainway here. Johnny Paul Canerco bag. You also have aluminum foil on the inside. Anderson has to jump out of the way. Yeah, for all of your uh, for all of your network television stations that you need you just wrap yourself in the bag and quickly you get CBS well with Anderson jumping out of the way of that ball we'll see what comes next it's another inside pitch Steve Stone yeah that last pitch was a touch inside do we think Tim's getting visited in there because of the home run. Oh, perhaps, but I don't think anything is untoward. Nah. One of the reasons you have to think about is that get a guy on the mound throwing probably, but Dean thrown 88, 89. What I'm hitting Tim Anderson and somebody gets 98 or 99 in the ribs on the twins and that one threw on inside and misses him. Well if you missed it Tim in the third inning hit a two run homer and the pitcher Tyler Duffy did not like Anderson's walking reaction to the home run. Check swing, ball low. He did go, says Pat Hobart. And two down. The appeal? There's the swing, and could have gone either way. It didn't look like he went around, but Pat Hobart says he did, so that's the second out. Two down for Melky. And time call. Six nothing. A run this inning. Three last inning. Two of the first. You know, Toronto had a, a bit of a bit of a scuffle 
in their series, I believe it was with the Yankees. It was the one when and lost a couple of guys. Yeah. They lost Joaquin Benoit for the rest of rest of the playoffs, I believe. Or close to it. Tore a muscle. Here's the first run of the ball game in the first inning. Tim Anderson. Gets a third base on a triple and then Melky slicing a double down the left field line with that first White Sox run. E Click Lending has donated $100 to the Pat Tillman Foundation supporting military veterans and their families. That was Devin Travis also for a bit. So there was a team that is in it playing against a team that was out of it, had a couple of dust ups, and wound up losing a couple of players. Never a particularly good idea when you're going to the playoffs and the other team is not. Flip to left. Grossman got a late start and this ball's down. Here comes Eaton. 7 0. The wind just batted that one down and Robbie Grossman got a bit of a late start on it and then couldn't. Recover. He comes on and had the ball, it looks like briefly, then it just eludes him. It's in the glove, then he throws it forward. So in this game, unlike football, the ground can cause a fumble, and Adam Eaton taking a look and keeps on going. Seven runs on the board for the Sox. The first pitch strike to Abreu. How about the fans? What a mix to click selection today with Melky Cabrera. By Melky. They're doing it with my Melky. You know, Mom always said, don't cry over spilled Melky. Okay. Yep. That, however, a huge run scored by Adam Eaton. Huge, I tell you. You are repulsive. <laughs> Ball and a strike out of Brayu. Time call. This Minnesota team loves to shift on Jose. Say he's driven in 17 runs against the Twins this year, 17 of his 99 against Minnesota. The Twins came in at 57 and 102, including a 13 game losing streak at the end of August. That's ball four and it's not close. Two on, two out here in the fourth. Twins came in with 57 wins, 102 losses. And that has secured them by a wide margin, first pick in the draft. Lefty lefty with Morneau. And a ball outside for Pat Dean, whose job is to get some outs in any way possible for this Twins bullpen. Duffy went only two plus, gave up six hits and five earned runs. Cabrera at second, Abreu at first. That's outside, 2 0. Oh. It's the second pick in the draft that is hotly contested. With Tampa Bay at 66 wins, Oakland at 67, Atlanta at 66, Cincinnati at 67, and Arizona at 66. And don't count out the Padres at 68 wins. 
be tough for them to lose enough. They only have three left. But they're hot. So. Actually, they've won six of their last ten. Foil their attempt at the second pick. Best laid plans, right? Uh, there are a lot of guys on a lot of those teams playing for jobs for next year. So. Yeah, and you know, look. If you're going to be bad in any given season, in order for you to help build, you might as well be very bad. There's no team that goes out and lays down for anybody. That I know. I mean, they go out with every intention of winning a ball game on a given night. Just some teams are due to injury, some teams because they just don't have the talent, whatever the case. They have really bad seasons, and they seem to take forever. Well, the Diamondbacks are a perfect example of injury really hurting. I mean, A.J. Pollock in spring training, that was a big loss, and they seemingly never recovered. They also made a trade getting Shelby Miller from Atlanta gave away a whole lot of talent. Dansby Swanson in Ciarde, one of the better center fielders around. That well, Pollock injury, is it first week of the yeah. season or spring training? I think it was right around spring training, yeah. I think. Omar. Home run number one of his career. Led off the inning. The Sox had followed with a couple more base runners. Two on right now. Cabrera at second. Abreu at first. Three and two. On the ground, second base, and Brian Dozier completes the inning. But it started this way. One of those times, silence is golden for Omar Narvaez. The loud crack of the bat that nobody, nobody wanted to talk to him. Seven nothing Sox. In Chicago, think eClick Lending. Whether you're looking to purchase or refi, never pay lender fees with eClick Lending. Visit us online at eClickLending.com to lock in your low rate today. eClick Lending. Point, click, and save. Fifth inning, eventful night at the ballpark. If you're looking for offense, it's on the scoreboard, not in your bag, man. 7 0. The Sox with the lead. And a first pitch, ball one to Vargas. So, during the break, we got the note about Carlos Rodon, who started this game with seven straight strikeouts. And dating back to his last start in Cleveland, he had struck out 10 in a row. It's the first time anybody in Major League Baseball had struck out 10 in a row since 2003 when Eric Gagne did it. 
in his Cy Young season with the Dodgers. 55 for 55 here. 82 innings in a third, 37 hits. For a guy who was a starter. Vargas goes down swinging, ninth strikeout for Carlos Rodon tonight. Ergani was a starter and was almost sent down to the minor leagues. It didn't look like he was going to be able to start the major leagues. He came back as a closer. I'd say it worked out pretty well for him. His walks and hits per nine inning, uh, per innings pitch, his whip was .692 that year. It's pretty good. And that's otherworldly. <laughs> Which brings up the question, A.L. Cy Young, we've talked about it before, but that's the precedent people are using for Zach Britton this year. Well, I think there's been there's been closers to win the Cy Young Award, and they usually win it in a year where there's been some good starters, just not one of the starters have been overwhelming. Now, Porcello going for win number 23, he's trailing the game tonight. That game three to one with Toronto on top in Boston in the top of the sixth inning. So that's one of the guys you would think. Chris Sale, let's assume he wins his 18th. That would be another guy you would consider. Corey Kluber, another guy you would consider. But I think this is the year where a closer sneaks in. Written at 47 for 47 and saves. Nobody's getting any hits. Very few of them scoring. And so it's been a, an enchanted year for him. And he's helping to pitch his team, it would appear, into the playoffs as they lead 8 to 1 over the Yankees. That's in the top of the eighth in New York. That's strike three. Ten strikeouts for Carlos Rodon. Three in a row again. And two out. And this time it's a fastball. That with good late movement, shaving off the outside corner. And Escobar for the second time down on strikes. Both of them swinging. The strong argument. For a starting pitcher, the strongest argument for a starting pitcher in the American League, if you go by wins above replacement, it's Corey Kluber. Chris Sale, as of today. Really? 5.3. Sale has jumped ahead of Kluber in the AL wins above replacement. With a chance actually to do a little bit better because Corey Kluber is not going to pitch these final three games. They're hoping that his quad heals enough. He'll have eight days of rest since the injury. To win the Indians will play their first of their postseason run. The question is, will he be available for Cleveland? Could determine everything. Right field, Adam Eaton, and that'll do it for the top of the fifth. Carlos Rodon has retired seven in a row, and he holds a seven-nothing lead.
Look forward to seeing you after the game. And the Sox hold a 7 nothing lead tonight with two in the first, three in the third, two in the fourth. And Todd Frazier loading up a rocket to right center field for a base hit to open the fifth. Here's your Sox math answer for tonight. Carlos Sanchez four home runs this month 13 seasons for Carlton Fisk 17 Chris Sabo only one year 1995 the goggles were on the south side Ron Kittle 100 RBIs in 1983 your winner was SSSP Knowles but we gave the prize the last two nights so hit the bricks Patrick LJ 1286 gets the prize tonight somebody's got to unseat P Knowles before this season's over though you have two shots at it you got to beat the guy he's won three in a row. Well we have the ideal gift for Patrick. What's that. Well it's something that is highly desirable but it's been here for a bit. And I promised. Gene Honda we would not raffle off the baseball that he autographed. We will we will give this one. Autograph baseball. Right here. Yep. Gene Honda. I think he signed it in April. But I'm not sure. But nonetheless, it's viable. As is the rain that's coming down, but it is an official game. Pop up, ranging out of play. You know, Gene hasn't been here a couple of times since the football season started. Yeah, He's got a lot of obligations, but the park. And we have some great fill in public address announcers, but Gene Honda sounds like he comes with the ballpark, doesn't he? He's got just a great voice and he does a few different things. There is Gene Honda, who is, I'll tell you what, you should take the baseball just because Gene is one of the smartest men in the park because he has the windows closed in his booth as the rain starts pelting down. Strike three on Sanchez, one down. He also has that wonderful old timey light in his boot. Kind of nice. Huh? Well, Omar is coming after a home run of the fourth. His sixth hit this year in 12 at bats against the Twins, his first career major league home run. One out, Narvaez, and a strike. It appears that Gene was bidding a dollar for his own baseball. For his own baseball, we'll sell it to him for. I told him we wanted to raffle it. The highest bid was 50 cents, so I think he wants it back. <laughs> On the ground at third, Escobar trying to start two, and they'll only get one. Dozier had to reach for it. Two out. Garcia coming up. Check out the Xfinity Fundamentals above left field at U.S. Cellular Field. It's accessible from the 100, 300, and 500 levels. Young Sox fans can learn baseball from White Sox Training Academy coaches. Don't miss the batting and pitching cages, base running areas, and be sure to check out the latest Xfinity technology, including the X1 platform. Two out, Leury Garcia. A seven-nothing lead on the board against Pat Dean, the reliever who came in in the third. Blue Jays still holding a lead on Boston, three to one. Although Xander Bogarts has just tripled for the Red Sox with one out in the sixth. Orioles blowing out the Yankees. Tigers with a big lead over Atlanta in the American League wildcard hunt. And on the National League side, the Cardinals still lead the Pirates one to nothing in the top of the sixth in St. Louis. And the Mets trying to put away the Phillies three outs away from that, leading 5-1 in the ninth. To third, Escobar giving ground. Throws out Narvaez, and that'll do it for the Sox in the fifth. Seven nothing, big score for the home team.
Now the latest prep scores, highlights, plays, and coach interviews, along with fan reaction from around Chicagoland on High School Lights, presented by Wintrust, live at 11 p.m. on CSN, and streaming live on CSNChicago.com. Look forward to that. We have a tweet I'd like to share that came in during the break from Indy Jeffrey, a suggestion of a prize for the prize show. Yes. For the Sox map, maybe next season. We have to get clearance from Clarence? Uh, well, from Peter Sagel of NPR for this. And here's why. The suggestion by Jeff was how about Gene Honda's voice on my voicemail as a Sox map prize? Which I think is a, is a really neat idea. The news quiz that they do weekly on NPR that's filmed and taped here in Chicago, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which we had a prize in the prize show for earlier this year, they've been doing for a long time the host's voice on your voicemail or answering machine, Carl Castle. So I think we'd have to get clearance from the Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me people before we ripped off their idea so brazenly, especially after mentioning it on this telecast. Tell you what. This seems to be a good idea to me. Okay. I will text Gene Hunt. Okay. Then I will hold you out of the booth into his booth. You can have your phone record a bunch of names. Bill, Bob, Jack, Joan. You know, and have him do it over and over again. And eventually somebody with that name is going to be able to get it. And that way then you come back in the booth and you'll have it on your phone. My question to you is why do I have to be suspended outside of the booth? That, for this? Adds, that adds a bit of danger to it. So we need it to be a high risk voicemail? Yes. Is that that will mean that much more to whoever it is who gets the prize off the prize show. Not so good for you, but very good for them. And is inside for ball four, Logan Shaver is on. And I'll take this moment to remind you that you can join us for the last regular season home game as the Sox face the Twins Sunday, October 2nd, 2.10 p.m. It's Fan Appreciation Day where we will not hang you out the window. Hundreds of prizes will be given away throughout the game. Hope you can join us for Fan Appreciation Day at the ballpark Sunday, 2.10 start time. Carlos Rodon with his second walk and ball one to Byron Buxton. We were talking last time. Some fireworks going off in the distance. When a left hander, especially left hand pitcher, when he faces a lineup of nine right hand hitters, you get a release point. You don't vary from that. It becomes a lot easier to use that release point and never, never lose it. That's why I always like a couple of left handers interspersed against a left hand pitcher and the one guy he's failed to get out tonight is Logan Schaefer lone left hander in this lineup because you're so used to looking at the outside corner to a right hand hitter throwing your slider low and in to the right hand hitter when a lefty comes up you have a completely different sight line. And that's why. Frazier has it playing off his glove. Could have been two. And Schaefer stumbled around second. He gets back. It's an error on Frazier. Gave up some ground and then going to his left. Could not corral it. Hit off the glove. And now two on. Nobody out here in the top of the sixth. It's in between Hop and as he goes back, the ball just seems to flatten out under the glove. So you'll have an opportunity at a redeemer in this one for Todd. It's air number 12. We've seen in this homestand even some brilliant plays on the backhand side for Frazier. He's had many more plays, at least this homestand. Toward the line that he has going towards second base. Ball one to Brian Dozier, who can certainly change a game with his power.
Dozier's hit eight home runs against the Sox this year, so he hasn't minded seeing this pitching staff. We talk about a dead pole hitter. Brian Dozier has been that so far this year. He has grounded into a double play in the third inning tonight. That went to the left side to Frazier at third. Two big power hitters in this game, Dozier and Frazier. And this is what their home runs look like. Two real strong pull hitters. If you're a right fielder and Dozier or Frazier are at the plate, it's probably not going over your head. Now, and you can see Dozier even more of a dead pull hitter. That occasionally will hit him to center field. Just like that, he hits one into right field. How about it? See, that's what you get. What? I didn't do it. You sure? It wasn't your computer antics? Well, it didn't leave the park. No, it didn't. Sinking line drive, well hit. And the first hit of the night for Dozier. Only the second hit for the Twins. So bases loaded. Nobody out for Polanco and Robin Ventura mulling over a menu of options that he didn't necessarily think he'd have to worry about this inning. That one gets away from Omar and Schaefer scores. The Twins are on the board. Bob Rosenberg. His definitive call of a wild pitch as that one gets away. So Carlos Rodon trying to get back to where he was for those 10 strikeouts and only allowing one hit in the first. Five innings again, he did get the ground ball he wanted after the leadoff walk. The error prolonged the inning, and now it's a matter of pitching over it. There's a strike outside corner, one and one. Last time out, he had his career high with 11 strikeouts. At only 80 pitches, you would think that. He can right the ship and surpass the 11. One and two on Polanco. He struck out in the first, as did Grossman, as did the first seven batters of the game for Minnesota. Wind starting to kick up a bit. One and two. Line to right field, a base hit for Polanco. Dozier to third as Buxton scores. It's seven to two. Going to bring Don Cooper out from the dugout. Polanco drives in his 24th run. Was an All-Star last year at Double A. Let's think he's got a chance to be pretty good. at the corners and nobody out. Bullpen has started to loosen up with some exercises but nobody is throwing quite yet. Looks like they're going to get somebody up. Jacob Turner, Anthony Renato, Renato on the left. Turner on the right with Mark Salas now moving in between them. Rodon to Grossman. Strike one. Nice placement. Walk error single single. A 7 2 game. Go 
Don lays it in again. One ball and two strikes on Grossman. Remember the Twins came back from a big deficit earlier this year. Not to win, but to at least make it interesting late. That was back on June 29th. The Sox entered the ninth inning up nine to one. The Twins scored five runs, sending up ten batters in the ninth inning. And the Sox eventually won nine to six as Nate Jones saved the game. This game was seven nothing until this sixth inning when the Twins have put up two runs before their first out. Two and two from Rodon. It's inside. Three and two. Got Sano and Vargas coming up this inning between them in four at bats. They fan four times. Inside ball four. The bases are loaded. Nobody's out in the sixth inning. Chris Beck starting to throw. It already from Don Cooper. The next one will signal a substitution for the Sox. Well, the next one, if anything, is going to be Nervais or Frazier going to the mound to buy a little time for Chris Beck. If things don't work out very well in this event, well, it's a favorable matchup for Rodon, at least historically, here. It's an 0 1 for 11 against Rodon. So no. Has taken it deep. That one hit was a home run. Base is loaded. Dozier at third, Polanco at second, Roseman at first. Pretty decent speed on the base paths for the Twins. And the trip to the mound for the Ryans. The wind whipping here in Chicago. The game becoming a little messy. After a clean first five frames for Carlos Rodon. This is pitch number 90. Not close, 2 and 0. Danger time here. Fastball count for Sano. He goes after it and lifts it to right field. Eaton is back. Eaton at the wall. Adam makes the catch. Dozier tags and scores. It's seven to three. But that one got up in the wind and it came very close to drifting out of the ballpark. <laughs> Goes to sacrifice fly. Again, number 63 is Sano goes down, reaches out, gets a 96 mile an hour fastball, and comes an eyelash from a grand slam. Another strong play in right field for Adam Eaton, possible gold glover in the Sox outfield. Now Vargas takes strike one. can get him to hit the ball on the ground. It'll be a pretty easy two. Grossman at first, Polanco at third. Twenty-six-year-old first baseman Vargas, who had hit lefties to the tune of 425 coming in. Two balls and a strike. There's the ground ball. Anderson, Sanchez, easy two, six, four, three, and the inning's over. Twins get on the board. Sox still lead by four.
Brought to you by T-Mobile. And it's news and notes. Brian Price agreed to a one-year extension. With a team option for 2018, that's the skipper at Cincinnati Reds and Chicago Cubs who announced an extension for Theo Epstein. Today announced extensions through 2021 for the general manager, Jed Hoyer, and senior VP, Jason McLeod. And here's last night, a controversial ending to a big ball game. Brian Price got his extension for his ability to chase down the umpires, evidently. This ball from Yadier Molina goes over the wall and hits above the fence off that MoLottery.com side. It should be a ground rule double. However, the ruling was that Brian Price did not signal his intent immediately to challenge. So the run stood and the Cardinals won. Brian Price was very frustrated after the game. Some reporters timed the amount of time in between the play happening and Brian Price signaling and looking for the umpires. They said it was somewhere between 28 to 32 seconds. The rule being on the final play of the game you need to make an immediate signal that you want to challenge the play. Now a couple questions arise from that. Number one do we need something like a challenge clock to give managers an opportunity to have a, a very tangible amount of time. And number two, why wouldn't the umpires just wait on the last play of the game? Why do you have to make a decision faster on the last play of the game than you do in the middle of the game? Sanchez skewers this ball off of Polanco. Should say Eaton with a base hit to lead off the sixth inning. Adam Eaton is on with a leadoff single. I would think maybe the best of the events that could happen out of that is a signal from the manager to lock the gate so the umpires can't leave the field. We'll take another look as he hits it right off the glove of Polanco into center field. Eaton, who scored two runs, is aboard with his first hit. Leadoff single for Eaton now, Anderson. And so let's say it's 30 seconds, not 28, 32, put it right in the middle of 30. Doesn't seem like an inordinate amount of time. The umpires would hang around just a bit. When you took a look at it, it was clearly one hop in over the fence, which would have made it a ground rule double and taking that eventual winning run, putting it back at third. So a controversial way to end what could turn out to be a very big ball game for St. Louis. And for the Giants. And for, and the, for the Mets. And for the entire cast of Wild Carters. Brian Price argued after the game as well that his phone was ringing. The dugout phone was ringing and over the, the din in St. Louis, over the loud crowd noise, he couldn't hear the phone. So he'd have picked it up faster, which leaves us to the question of do we need a blinking light on the video phone for situations like that? Two strikes on Anderson. And that's a ground ball through Tim. With a base hit, Eaton slams on the brakes. You know, to the to the point, we're talking about a lot of ancillary things. Why not just have the umpires wait on the last play of the game? Why not have the last play of the game be ultimately just reviewed? Why why are we leaving it up to blinking lights on a phone and managers getting the call within 30 seconds? You would think it would be just common sense if there was any even a hint of a play that might be reviewed you would hang around for a bit didn't work out that way but again replays are a work in progress we knew that coming in to the replay play scenario which is being evened out and smoothed out with every passing year I'm sure we're going to see something that is going to make that a little bit easier on everybody the managers and the umpires involved in a play like that or any play to end the ball game that again even is close to review. I think if you're a fan sitting at home what you're saying is we're spending so much time on reviews in game on plays that seem inconsequential. How can we possibly how can we possibly get the last play of the game wrong. There need to be safeguards you would imagine as Melky is dropped by that pitch inside. Meantime on that base hit by Anderson. 
He's got at least one more at bat and he is a double away from hitting for the cycle. Bonus a strike on Melky. And that's not even meant as a, as a criticism of the replay system. As you said, it's a work in progress. Baseball's done a good job every year of making changes to it to improve. And you can't anticipate every situation. You would imagine that last play of the game thing would get legislated after this season. Yeah, especially as it's come up in what turns out to be a key game. One, two. Oh, Molitor working that gum hard. His team with a three run top of the sixth. And the Sox have come back almost immediately. Back to back singles to lead off the sixth, and Melky goes down swinging. And that's going to be it for Dean as Muller coming out. He's got a lot of work out of him after he came in the game with Duffy lasting two plus innings. Dean came on. And Light is coming in the game. As he comes Pat. in, we'll step out. Dining and service while enjoying a breathtaking view of U.S. Cellular Field from the First Merit Bank Stadium Club. Memberships are available to season ticket holders and open before, during, and after every home game. First Merit Bank Stadium Club is also perfect for non game day events, including weddings and corporate parties. Our Hyundai call to the pen is Pat Light. He comes in with. Base runners at first and second out for the 17th time. ZRA, well, it's up there. More walks and strikeouts, that's not good. Opponents hitting 319. Came over from the Red Sox, Pat Light did. He throws strike one to Jose Abreu, Eaton at second, Anderson at first, one out. It's a good look at Berger right there. Nachos too. My favorite hamburgers. But with nothing on it. Plain. Plain. Yep. Pretty good. Ball to strike out of Brayu. He's one for two with an RBI double. By the way, the Red Sox have tied the game. Against the Blue Jays, 3-3 in the seventh. Mookie Betts with an RBI single. 
would be a big help to the Detroit Tigers if the Red Sox could complete the comeback. Tigers were a game and a half back coming in. One and two on Abreu. Thanks to those of you just joining us after watching the Cub game. Sox have taken the lead early and held on to it. It's seven to three in the sixth inning. Sox got two runs in the first, three in the third, two more in the fourth. Couple of home runs. Tim Anderson, a two run shot. Omar Narvaez, a solo home run. And Melky Cabrera, a three hit night. Anderson. A double shy of the cycle and Carlos Rodon on the mound struck out the first seven batters to tie an American League record. That light came over in a trade with Fernando Abad left handed specialist going to Boston. Light's got good enough stuff the question is can he get the ball over the plate consistently. Ball hammered foul by Abreu. Both runners going. And they'll have to go back. Jose Abreu, one RBI away from 100. It would be his third straight major league season with 100 runs driven in. Three and two. On the ground, third base side, Escobar. Right, number two, Eaton to third, Anderson to second. Mentioned Carlos Rodon striking out the first seven to tie an American League record. Dozier to lead it off, and then Polanco, both swinging. Grossman Paul. Zeno swinging. Vargas swinging. And Escobar, that's six in a row. And it was Murphy on a called third, and the spell was broken. As Logan Schaefer doubled on a fastball in the third inning to break the streak. It was 10 straight strikeouts for Carlos Rodon, dating back to his prior start in Cleveland. Now, with two out, Justin Morneau takes a strike at the knees. Brilliant start to the day for Carlos Rodon, who's made it through six with two earned runs against him. Called a strike. Close pitch, probably a little bit of a favor to light. 0 oh 2. The Red Sox had tied the game against the Blue Jays. They now have taken the lead five to three in the seventh inning. David Ortiz, a two run home run for the Red Sox, who would push the Blue Jays with a win here. Just a half game ahead of the Tigers for that second spot in the AL Wild Card. This all turned on one swing from Hyun Soo Kim a couple of nights ago at Rogers Center. Osuna trying to nail it down for Toronto and a pinch two run homer wound up winning it. And that one came very close to getting Todd Frazier, who probably thinks he might be in the wrong spot. On deck circle, sometimes it gets a little busy. Yeah, you certainly have to be heads up. One and two. Yeah, that'll get your heart started, pumping a little bit more. 
trying to calm it down. Two and two. Eaton at third, Anderson at second. And that's ball three on Morneau with Frazier coming next. That homer for David Ortiz was against Brett Cecil, who had just come into the game replacing Joe Biagini. 3 2 on the ground, back to light. And that'll do it. Sox leave two. After six, seven three, the Sox of the lead. January 27th through January 29th brings all the ballpark fun to the Hilton Chicago. You'll score an autograph or photo with current players, coaches, and White Sox greats. Your favorite areas are back with an interactive space to play games, win prizes, and shop for team gear. It'll be a weekend of White Sox baseball that you won't want to miss. We get a new pitcher in the ball game, so the night is done for Carlos Rodon. He went six innings, gave up three runs, two earned on three hits. He walks 10 strikeouts on for the 24th time is Chris Beck. He's two and two his ERA up close to seven. There you look at the numbers and he's got a four run lead to protect with the bottom part of the order coming up. Beck's first pitch fades away to Eduardo Escobar for ball one. By the way the Boston's now have a two run lead over Toronto five to three and what would be a crushing loss for the Blue Jays. Yeah, that David Ortiz home run giving the Red Sox that lead. That after an earlier Jose Bautista home run off of Rick Porcello for the Blue Jays. A 3 0 from Beck. Stays on the plate, three and one for Escobar, and that's what the Red Sox have the luxury of. Nobody's going to get the Golden Sombrero tonight unless Escobar can't take advantage of a 3 1 count. He's 0 for 2 with two strikeouts. That's ball four. The Red Sox have the luxury of Koji Uehara in the eighth and then Kimbrell in the ninth. They've been very strong in September. For the Red Sox, it is doubtful if they're going to be able to catch Texas for the best record in the league. But for them, it's just a chance to do some damage to Toronto. One on for John Ryan Murphy, the catcher. 
It was 0 for 2 with a strikeout looking at a flyout. Ball number one. Nate Jones throwing in the pin is. Baez goes out there by a little time for Nate. He's back having some problems getting the ball over the plate. Six pitches, five out of his own for back so far. National League race, the Giants and Dodgers are just underway. Six nothing St. Louis over Pittsburgh, home seventh inning in St. Louis. And the Mets have won tonight, five to one. In the air, right center field, Leori Garcia on the charge. Time for tonight's edition of Sticks and Stones. Steve, where we ask you about your own career. How'd you do against Michael Cubbage? Another left hand hitter, because I don't think I could beat the Twins very often. I will say that I didn't do well. He also played with the Mets. I'd have faced him there a time or two. Well, even if you didn't do well against him, you win the bonus round of Sticks and Stones today. Because back in 1973, on this day, you pitched one of your best ball games. You know that? I do. I didn't know it was this day, but I remember it. It's a punt by Schaefer, play. and Frazier has no chance on Schaefer, who's been on three times. Heads up play, but he lays down a perfect bunt. And Narvaez, in the vacated. Third base hustles down there. You could hardly roll it out there any better. Todd Frazier tries to get it over there, but not near in time. Yeah, back in 1973, nine innings, three hits, 12 strikeouts for one Steve Stone. And fortunately, it was on the road. So we were able to score in the tenth, and then Saya Costa kindly came on, pitched the tenth inning, and that was that. One to nothing win. Buxton in the air, left field. Melky on the move into foul ground. It should be stated that without that win, which was a huge win, I wouldn't have been able to go six and eleven. Well, Cubbage was four out of seven. Yeah, well, I told you I didn't do well. Another left-hand hitter, a hated left-hand hitter. So, but his OPS, fortunately, was just thirteen thirty-nine. Yeah, tiny. Yeah. That was your. Uh, that was your. The the game against the A's. That was your last game with the Sox. The first time around. Yes, I was traded that winter, along with a few other folks, to the Chicago Cubs in exchange for Ron Sato in a trade that I've described many times as a trade that hurt both teams. Mutual detriment. Ron came over, played just one more year before he retired. I was a 20 game winner with the Cubs, but it took me three years. That wasn't too good. Oh, one swing and a miss by Dozier. Two strikes from back to Dozier here in the seventh inning. I was able to come back over here in the first free agent year to a very exciting White Sox team, the Southside Hitmen. That was entertaining. We had the lead for. Four and a half months before Kansas City, a really good team finally ran us down. The Southside Hitmen, very well known in White Sox lore. Beck strikes out Dozier and retires the side. To stretch time, we go. It's 7 3 Sox.
Baseball is with MLB.com and BAT, the number one app for live baseball. Enjoy live look ins, highlights, game day scores, stat cast, live radio broadcasts, and more. That's really a great app and something that you can see every major league game. The one rain delay in this series, we're able to see that the game where Baltimore came back to beat Toronto as the rain fell here. We watched a crushing blow to the Toronto Ball Club by the Orioles. You put that game away if you're Toronto, and then suddenly you pick up, I mean, you pick up essentially two games with every win against yeah. Baltimore. Ball to strike on Frazier, and then the next night the Orioles win again and draw even closer, and now tonight Baltimore. Having a little trouble getting off the hook in the ninth inning, but leading eight to one. The Yankees have loaded the bases. But the Red Sox lead the Blue Jays 5 3, going to the bottom of the eighth at Fenway Park. With a seven run lead, if the Yankees can't hit a seven run home run, eventually, if that one tightens up, they're going to see Zach Britton. And nobody's been able to solve him yet this year. You wouldn't think it would be tonight. Two and one to Frazier. He's in for a strike, two and two. By the wild card standings, as they look right now, you've got Baltimore and Toronto tied. The Tigers a game and a half back entering play today. Tigers are, as we've said, leading six to one in Atlanta. Got to be careful on these heaters up here. There's strike three. Frazier goes down swinging. What did you do? I burned my shoe. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. Come on. Yeah, it's hard to believe, but. Thought we were here. Can we? Thought I had to folks want to see this? Give me this shoe. <laughs> I want to show it to the folks at home. But we're going to have you to call the, your the fire department for a second. Gosh. We were going to give it away as a prize off the prize shelf, but now I to think Patrick it's Knowles. Yeah, and now, it's Patrick Knowles. No, it's it's a defective now shoe. Ground ball up the middle for Sanchez, and he was thrown out. Polanco got it, two down. Only you can prevent booth fires. Really tragedy. Well, not necessarily a tragedy, but. You said your shoe was defective. I tend to think the occupant <laughs> it's, might it, be defective. It is operator error, I think. That's Two down for a valuable lesson here tonight. Which is what? What's your takeaway from that, Steve? Don't put your shoe on the heater. It's a pretty narrow takeaway. Ball one to Narvaez. Deck circle, Garcia that time could pluck it. Omar is always going to remember this night for a leadoff home run in the fourth inning. Into the bullpen, his first major league home run. It's been a year of first for Omar, who's done a really nice job since coming up. Alex Avila got hurt. Omar has had an opportunity to show what he can do, and he's been very steady. And the twins pen up and going. It's Sean O'Rourke. Brother Ryan, actually. Well, it's Ryan O'Rourke. Wow. Maybe a trip to the eye doctor would be in order also. Burn your well, corneas well, too. Well, well, I'm getting my shoe done. Three and one on the ground, second base. We have perfected the self hot foot for more tricks of the trade. Join us in the eighth, seven three, the Sox.
season finale as our Sox look to end the 2016 season with a win over the Twins. Coverage begins at 1.30 with White Sox pregame live presented by the Koalas family of dealerships on CSN Chicago. And we'll take a look at the PNC Bank matchups. Former White Sox pitcher Hector Santiago will go to the mound for the Twins. James Shields looking for win number seven. That is tomorrow night. And then on Sunday, Jose Barrios, a two and seven with an ERA that's up there against Chris Sale looking for number 18 in the finale starting at 210. Two games remaining after tonight in the 2016 season. Jorge Polanco leads off the eighth and takes ball number one. Jason Benetti, Steve Stone along with you, our entire crew. Thanks for joining us not only tonight but throughout this 2016 year. We've enjoyed your company all year long. Tag to center field on a 1 0. It's a base hit for Polanco, who's got two straight hits. It's a big day in baseball history. What did happen as we look back? Final game at Old Division. Sox beat the Mariners 2 1. Back in 1990. I like that ballpark. You did? Yeah. It's kind of nice. Great park to pitch in, by the way. I was too young to remember much of it, but I was there a couple times. Yeah, certainly. very nice. <laughs> One strike on Grossman. Two. Bobby Thickpen, the final pitcher on the mound over at Old Comiskey. Manning the bullpen for the current Sox. Telling Nate Jones that get it heated up. This is his second time up, so he's ready to go. Floated to left. Melky on the run, and that bounces fair. For Robbie Grossman, Polanco to second and back. Hits it off the end of the bat and it drops. And that is going to be the last pitch for Chris Beck. Robin takes his long slow walk to the mound. He's going to call in Nate Jones. He's already done that. So two out nobody on. And we'll step out. We'll be back with Nate Jones after these messages.
with some problems. Here is Nate Jones. He comes out for the 71st time. It's been just a great year for Nate. His ERA at 2.33, his record 5 and 3. 80 strikeouts and 69 and two thirds. He's got to go through a couple of power hitters and Sano and Vargas and then Escobar. Unless one of these gentlemen will kindly ground into a double play as Vargas did to end the sixth inning. Wouldn't that be chivalrous of one of these twins? A double play. Let's see. Sano drove in a run in the sixth. He struck out twice. In the second once and in the fourth the other time that was against Carlos Rodon who fanned 10 so 21 strikeouts last two starts for Carlos who's still in line to win this ball game. Towering fly ball right field Eaton is back at the wall and this ball is foul. Fortunately that wind that's just howling toward the right field corner pushed that ball further foul as it was slicing down the line at plenty of plenty of distance. But fortunately foul. That would have made it terribly uncomfortable. So no with enormous power. Not particularly good direction that time. A long high volume strike for Miguel Sano. And now he's knocked back by Jones, one and one. Sano was a lifetime third baseman, wound up with Tommy John's surgery on his elbow, and then came back. Nothing wrong with his arm at all. His arm's still very strong, but they had Trevor Plouffe. They decided to try Sano in right field. And then Plouffe got hurt. And Sano has been the occasional DH. They would love to see him play third base full time, give them a little more flexibility in the designated hitter situation, especially with Maurer playing first. Maurer's legs aren't good. He's not playing, and Vargas is playing first base tonight. 18 home runs, 80 games last year for Sano. On the ground, Anderson Sanchez, double play. <laughs> there is that bouncing ball. Yeah, pretty good pitch. This ball outside off the plate. Sano tries to pull it, and it's very easy after that. Carlos Sanchez has been very strong turning the double play at second base. Three double plays tonight for the Sox defense. Now Vargas can't hurt you nearly as much. That's outside 3 and 0 from Nate Jones who replaced Chris Beck this inning after Beck allowed back to back hits for Nate. He's not surrendered an earned run or a run of any kind since August the 29th. That is ball four and he pitches whether intentionally or not around Vargas and runners at the corners two down in the eighth. It's up to Escobar, who's over two, couple of strikeouts and a walk, no contact yet tonight. Nate is one of those guys that falls into the category of being a supreme setup man, and you know he's got big time closer stuff. David Robertson is here to close. He's done it for a long time, and Nate will wait his turn and eventually one day get an opportunity to close. Slider strike one to Escobar.
And you'd have to think when he got his opportunity stuff's good enough for him to be. Very successful in that role. And generally. Seemingly and you don't know until you're thrust into the role but seemingly a level headed guy. Who's not going to go crazy after a blown save. There really is no. Apparent reason why some guys thrive in that role. And others don't. But the history of baseball is littered with guys who were exceptional as setup men, almost unhittable. And then, because they have a safety net, that safety net being the closer, they are thrust into a situation where they are the guy now, and there is no safety net. And some guys thrive, and other guys just can't do it. And you never know what it is until you get a chance to do the job. First base of Rayu inning over two left on Nate Jones does the trick once again seven three Sox. Here to do the post game show, Subaru post game live, live from the booth here at U.S. Cellular Field. If anybody can do it, it's our Chuck, and we've got new pitcher in the ball game, Ryan O'Rourke, on for the 25th time. His ERA just under four. He's 0 and 1. He inherits a ball game that finds his team trailing by four on Hispanic Heritage Night. Oh, souvenir and a sombrero. That's a big night at the ballpark. O'Rourke has strike one to Leori Garcia. He's one for three with a single to right tonight. O'Rourke, left hander on a Worcester Mass by way of Merrimack College. Two on Garcia. Mentioned today being an important day in baseball history. It was also the debut of Sam Malone on your television screen. Cheers premiered this day in 1982. May Day brought into our hearts, and down goes Garcia, one away. And it was May Day earlier in the booth. Steve Stone had his foot on our space heater. And if you could see, there's a, there's a little bit of fire damage on the shoe. You had your you had your foot on the heater. And for all you youngsters out there, that's a lesson in life. If you have a space heater, don't put your shoe on it if the sole is rubber. If you do and leave it there long enough, 
it will stick to the heater and eventually melt. But you'll know that it's there as the heat starts to build up. Yeah, you know. That's it. You learn something new every, every day. Every, you know, every day. The look on your face was priceless. Well, it was startling, actually. Yes, not a great thing. But certainly a lesson learned. Wear leather shoes. Bill Melton will join us at the booth shortly. Steve still <laughs> Melton. <laughs> One out for Adam Eaton. Good to see you're still limber after your playing days, too, with the whole Rockettes act you just did on the table. That's from Pilates <laughs> on a daily basis. <laughs> Go to lunch with Bill Pilates. Two and two, three. Uh, we need to get you that hat, too. That is a good looking hat. How do the lights work there? They're battery operated? No, she's plugged into she's plugged into the space heater. Watch your feet. <laughs> what do you think the, the life is on those lights? How long can that hat last in public? Oh, probably to the 10th or 12th inning. You think so? Hopefully we will not see that this evening. Eaton floats it to short and Polanco awaits the arrival of out number two. Two down for Tim Anderson who is a double away from his first career cycle. Last cycle Jose Valentin against the Orioles April 27th. In the year 2000. And that had to have been intentional. Well, actually, you don't have to warn him. You need to throw him out of the game because that was quite obviously intentional. The trip Gibson is warning him, which, you know, it's in the ninth inning. We'll go back to the home run and show you why this happened. So he hits it eight miles. And he stops to look at it. But it wasn't all that long. I mean, yeah, he turned around, he looked at it, and then took off. So, at any rate, apparently it aggravated a few of these Minnesota twins. Ground ball to third. And look, if you're going to take it out on anybody, just get the guy out. That's the answer. You get the guy out, we don't have any problems. 7 3, Sox with the lead. Tim Anderson, a great night. Earlier in the game, it's Miller time brought to you by Miller Light. And here's our Miller moment, and it is 
something that Omar Narvaez will remember forever. In the bullpen, his first major league home run. They give him the silent treatment, and then everybody jumps on him. Give him some noogies. There you go. Beat on him for a bit. He'll take it. He'll take it indeed. And Tommy Canely comes in the ball game. It's a four run game. And we hope after the benches were warmed, we have an inning of baseball. And that's all she wrote. I hope everybody's even, right? Anderson, the home run. The Twins didn't like it. Throw behind him once, and then we can play on. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. John Ryan Murphy, Logan Schaefer, Byron Buxton to bat. Strike one to Murphy from Tommy Canely. Oh and two. Carlos Rodon tonight six innings three hits two earned runs and the three run inning for the twins was propped up by an error. Rodon strikes out ten tying an American League record with seven strikeouts in a row to open the game. He's in line to win game number nine making him nine and ten for the year. Last year he was three over 500. This year, if this one holds up, and you would assume that it would, you'd be one under. Had that dugout injury that cost him a couple of weeks. Yeah, he's got a chance to be very much of a top of the rotation starter. Tim Anderson falls a double shy of the cycle tonight. Melky three hits as well. Omar Narvaez, we showed you that first major league home run. Adam Eaton has scored twice. Now 89 runs scored this year for Eaton. Sox trying to pick up win number 78 at the expense of the Twins, who have lost 9 of 11 coming in. A little bit of a chilly night. To short, Anderson plants and comes down Murphy. Murphy could hardly hit the ball any harder than that. Hit it to the wrong guy. Anderson. Got a very strong arm, having an opportunity in a one hop rocket to plant the back foot and fire it across. Murphy out easily. Well, Tim Anderson has shown the range at shortstop, he's shown the arm at shortstop, and he's shown the ability to make low probability plays. You know he's going to make the great plays because he has spectacular range and a very strong arm. And it's only going to take repetition. It's going to take more and more appearances for him. You want him to be able to make all the routine plays. And he's made great strides in just a short time he's been in the major leagues from what we saw in spring training certainly but from what we saw when he came up to the major leagues. Joe McEwing working with him a lot. On footwork, which is essential. On the ability to know when to charge plays, when to stay back, when you have to hurry, when you have some time. And overall, it's been just an outstanding year for him. Sanchez runs it down. Two out. And you're impressed with Tim Anderson's poise as well. I mean, he's somebody. The attitude is one of confidence yep. rather than cockiness, but the belief that he's going to be here 
And it strikes you as the Twins throw behind him in retribution for the home run that he's the type of person that will take that and try and do something on the field about it. Yeah, I think in throwing behind him and not hitting him. That was probably the best course of action if the Twins felt they had to do something. And you get the argument like, hey, we don't like what you did. Yeah. That's what that's the baseball rule book there. Going a strike from Kane lead to Buxton. Two out, ninth inning. 7 3 Sox with the lead. Two and one to Buxton. Sox trying to win four of five on the homestand to open it. Go 12 and five for the year against the Twins. Two and two on Buxton. Two down. Kainley got him in the Sox win. And a nice job. Tim Anderson came a double away from the cycle. It was an offensive night. Carlos Rodon flirting with history with seven straight strikeouts to lead the ball game off. And wound up with 10 last time out. He got a career high 11 strikeouts, went six innings, and then turned it over to the bullpen. And Beck, Jones, and Canley shut it down. Sox are winners over the Twins tonight from U.S. Cellular Field. So, for our director, Jim Angie, our producer, Keon Dolachaki, our associate producer, Dave Ross, tech manager, Mark Harper, the executive producer, Jim Corno Jr. He's Steve Stone. I'm Jason Benetti saying so long for our entire crew from U.S. Cellular Field. Coming up next, Subaru Post Game Live with Chuck and Bill. They're in the booth. They're ready to go. You're watching Chicago White Sox Baseball on Comcast Sportsnet.